the only thing I really cared about, the only thing I really knew for sure was I want to keep training. That was, it was like wherever, wherever I go, no matter what happens, wherever I end up, I just want to keep training. What is happening, everybody? Welcome. You're tuned in to Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio, episode 602, with my guest today, Sensei Matt King. I am Jeremy Lesniak. I'm your host for the show. I'm the founder at Whistlekick, and there's a good chance that we have something in common, because you don't host the show, and you don't own Whistlekick, but you're probably into martial arts like I am, which is why we do all the things that we do, and it's probably why you're listening to what we're doing here today. We love martial arts, traditional martial arts specifically. And if you want to see everything that we're doing, go to whistlekick.com. It's our online home. It's where we sell stuff and link to stuff that we do. It's our digital hub, our online home. And if you see something in the store that floats your boat, use the code podcast 15, saves you 15% off, reminds us that, hey, listeners buy stuff and it helps us justify to the bean counters, the accountants. And all those folks that, yeah, what we're doing here with this show actually has a purpose. So help us to that end, if you wouldn't mind. Martial Arts Radio, this show, it gets its own website. WhistlekickMartialArtsRadio.com because nobody's ever accused me of naming things creatively. The show comes out twice a week and the entire purpose behind everything that we do, well, it's to connect. It is to educate and to entertain traditional martial artists throughout the world. If you want to support that work, There are lots of ways you can do it. You can make a purchase. I already said that. You could share an episode. We really appreciate when you do that. You could follow us on social media. We're at Whistlekick everywhere you might imagine. You could tell a friend about us. In fact, within martial arts schools, people telling other people about the show and what we do, that's the best and number one way that we grow. You could pick up one of our books on Amazon. We're adding titles all the time. Did you know that? You could leave a review on Google or Facebook or Apple Podcasts or wherever, anywhere that makes sense. Or you could support us on Patreon. Patreon.com, P-A-T-R-E-O-N.com slash Whistlekick. It's the place to go. You can support us monthly with as little as $2. $2 a month. I feel like I should have dramatic music and be begging you, but we're not begging you. Why? Because we're actually going to give you more than $2 back. In fact, every support tier at Patreon you don't just give us money. You give us something and we give you a bunch of stuff back. At $2, we give you upcoming guests, behind the scenes information. $5, you get a bonus audio episode. $10, you get bonus video. And it goes up from there and includes book drafts and private training and all kinds of crazy stuff. So go to Patreon, patreon.com slash whistlekick and jump on and help us out. Help us keep this ship rolling. Had a great time talking with Sensei Matt King here. And as we get through the episode, and you're going to hear this, there was a point where one of my theories was challenged. And I asked him about it. And one of the things that we end up talking about, he has become an exception to one of my, I don't want to call it a rule, but one of my theories. And I found that absolutely fascinating. So we talk about that a little bit. And we talk about a bunch of other stuff with the arts that he's done and how they connect and and just, well, it's a good episode. It's a great episode. You're going to love it. Check it out. Enjoy. And I'll see you in the outro. Hey, Sensei Matt, welcome to the show. How are you? I'm doing very well. Happy Tuesday. Thanks for having me. Happy Tuesday. Yeah, it's a Tuesday. We almost exclusively record on Tuesdays. Oh, wow. Just, you know, we, we, we cram them together. We used to do it. It used to, when I started the show, it was whenever somebody could do it sure and so my life revolved around this show and as that stopped working because you know before the show and after the show you know you you can't just switch gears and start doing something else and recently we went to every other tuesday and we're trying to cram three to four episodes in per day wow when we record so you are interview number three for the day and andrew our our mutual acquaintance friend andrew adams we recorded an episode in between so this is the fourth episode i'm recording today wow you are warmed up i am warmed up hopefully not tired hopefully i can keep up with you we'll see how it goes i feel pretty good (laughs) (laughs) all right well it's a martial arts show and we talk about martial arts specifically your martial arts journey now quite often i will ask a very simple straightforward obvious question how did you get started but i want to i want to 
tweak that a little bit, just, just to keep you on your toes, keep the audience on their toes. If you were to make a comic book or a movie or a TV show, some kind of artistic representation of your martial arts journey, what would be the, the movie poster or the TV poster or the, the, the cover art that would entice people into learning more about your martial arts journey? Wow, that's a issue. It's it's issue one or the first episode or the beginning of the movie, right? Or the first movie in the series. So it's still got to cover the beginning. But how would we represent the beginning in an in, in a way that makes people say, oh, "I want to know more"? In the beginning, <laughs> uh, that's a really good question. Well, and I feel like I can answer, you know, the original, the, the like you said, kind of the more general question in that. My parents got me into martial arts when I was a kid because I wanted to grow up and be a Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtle. Okay. And I told them that. Nice. Uh, so they were like, well, <laughs> you know, if, if a kid has some direction, you should really support it. Oh, man, if it had to be a movie poster, like, it would have to be, like, a kid reading Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtle comic books and watching the cartoon and thinking about how, like, you know, that was just the best ever and, you know, wanting, wa trying to train the way they were training and do the things they were doing. And I'm, I'm imagining younger you sitting down, eating a pizza in the living room. You've got, I don't know how old you are, but I'm, I'm 42. And so back when I was a kid, a lot of people had those very enormous console sat on the floor TVs. Oh, I'm imagining yeah. you all sitting on the floor. Okay. So you know what I'm talking about sitting in front of those, one of those watching Ninja Turtles on Saturday morning and you've got toy, maybe Nerf martial art, you know, like a Nerf sword sitting next to you. You're holding it. There's cheese dripping down your arm. There's imagination bubbles of you as like the fifth turtle. Oh God. Yeah. Oh yeah. That, that, that does that seem representative? Uh, Would that work? And like not far off of the mark at all of what actually <laughs> happened. I think, how, do you, how do you think I can imagine that? Uh, I, I, yeah. I kind of lived it as well. I get it. We're here. We're here, brother. I found you. <laughs> yes. Yes. Uh, I was, I can't Not tell on. you how many times, how many plastic swords my mother or father bought me. Because before I could go to the grocery store when I was a kid, I had to put them in the back of my shirt because I, I wanted to be Leonardo <laughs> so bad. I wasn't the only one. It's good to know. And it's, it's just nice to know that, like, you grow up and everyone's like, no, nah, dude, that's normal. Like, I, I get that. We all did it. The, the number of ridiculous things we did as kids that as you get a little bit older, you're like, oh, I'm I'm the I'm the only one because we didn't you don't talk about those things. Yeah. Right. And if, and if you did talk about that in high school, everybody would lie and say, I never did that. And in the on the inside, they'd be like, oh, man, I actually really did that. And I thought that was a lot of fun. It, but now as really adults. We get to reminisce and talk about those things and and lament giving up that sort of imagination. Yeah, it's so very true. When you're like in your 20s or like early 20s, everyone's like, no, I didn't do anything like that. That's not cool. By the time you get to your 30s and 40s, you're like, man, I used to be so awesome. <laughs> yeah. I peaked when I was eight. Yeah. And what a <laughs> peak it was. <laughs> Absolutely. All right. So. So the genesis for your martial arts training was Ninja Turtles wanting to be a Ninja Turtle and your parents supported that. But how did that show up? You went to some manner of class, I assume. Yeah, I actually, uh, I'm born and raised in Rhode Island. In Rhode Island, you know, there is not the seven degrees of separation or seven degrees of Kevin Bacon or anything. You know, you're one or two degrees at best. Uh, everybody knows everybody knows everybody, even if you grew up in the north of the state versus the south of the state, you're you're two or three phone calls away from figuring out, you know, whose you know, cousins went to school with who else. Right. And it just so happened that my mother had known for quite some time a gentleman who taught martial arts. He had his own dojo. And I used to go with her to the hair salon. He was a, a hairstylist. And he knew that I liked karate, that I wanted to start getting into it. So I always I thought he was just the coolest guy in the world because he could like throw a sidekick at my at my head. Like that, that was just <laughs> that was a magic trick. Yeah, totally. Uh, so I, you know, 
didn't really have to like beg, borrow, steal or anything. I, I went to one class and I remember sitting in the, the, like the, the doorway entry to, from like the waiting room to the uh, actual floor. And I mean, I must've, I must've had a smile that went from ear to ear. I still remember watching my first karate class as a kid and thinking like, this is it. I know exactly what I want to do. And started class the next week. Of course, my two sisters had to start with me, and that was less cool. Mm, Older or younger? Both older. Two years older and four years older. Okay. So So kind of stealing your thunder, it felt like. Yeah. I mean, it was mostly like it got to the point where my oldest sister is shorter than, I mean, I I think I was taller than her when I was 10 and she was 14. Mm. So, you know, when we had to spar or we had to wrestle, I could totally beat her. But my other sister is a little bit taller, a little bit more wiry, and she used to just wipe the floor with me. Oh, my God. (laughs) It wasn't even fair. But that's where I started training there for a number of years. Uh, When I was a kid, I think I was there from like first grade to third grade or something, maybe a little bit longer. But took a break from that. Interest kind of changed. Family stuff changed. And then I started training again in... I just was getting into high school, leaving middle school, and it kind of worked out again that my father worked with someone who taught martial arts and Mm. trained two nights a week for, you know, two to three hours each class. We didn't have to pay. It was he was he was taught at a National Guard armory. We got to use like the gymnasium space, training on concrete floors with adults. Mm. And I thought it was that I had the same elation and smile looking forward to class every week. I, you know, would show up early and try and set up and I would run through everything and stretch out and then class would start and it was no joke. It was hard training and learning to break fall on concrete. And Mm. it was, it was fantastic. That was good stuff. Yeah, it was, it was a lot of fun. It, you know, and it's I I train thing I train in things that are very different now. When I got to college, I stopped training there. I started training somewhere else that was a little closer, a little bit different. But I imagine in the the times that I've talked, especially to other people about you know, oh my God, yeah, I remember when I used to train here when I was a kid, or I used to train here a long time ago. I may never want to do those type of styles or or, or arts again. But, oh, God, I would never trade it for anything in the world. Mm. It is it is just, you know, I have the fondest memories looking back on them. And, you know, it's something it's it's something that I appreciate that, you know, I'm I'm 15, 16 years old and I'm I've got to, you know, I got to put on the boots. I got to I got to get up there and, you know, train with adults. I got to keep up with them. I've got to, you know, learn differently than I think I might have if I was in a teenagers class yeah there's something about training with those where the the bar is set higher Mm -hmm. you know whether that's that's an age thing or a rank thing or a cultural thing you know that there's that that saying that a goldfish is going to grow to the size of the bowl it's put in Mm. right and i think quite often as martial artists when we teach kids especially in a mixed class where you've got you know, ages five to 12 and white belts to whatever, you know, we, we oftentimes artificially restrict those older, higher ranked kids. Yeah. Because they're kids. And I mean, we, we do it across everything. I think in society, we expect people to, you know, to be very limited. And here's an example of you. I would imagine if we were to compare your skills at that age, at that time, with that amount of investment to someone who spent more time in a friendlier, lighter, safer environment, you would have mopped the floor with them. <laughs> I would hope, but I mean, there's, there's <laughs> St- statistically, I'm, I'm not saying that, you know, we, we would have moved you from, from there up to, you know, pro fighter status. Yeah. Not yet. <laughs> that, come, that comes later. No. That, that was it. That was six months after. <laughs> yeah. Uh, it's also like, and for me, it was, it was something that was funny that I've, I've always been a bigger guy. I've always been, you know, the biggest person in any of my classes growing up in school. 
and being able to train with, you know, not having to train with people who I'm going to outweigh by 60 pounds on the, the best day was great. Cause I had, you know, I had adults that like I had to, I had to work for, I had to move, I had to, I had to try to do it. And I had to kind of rise to the occasion, like you were saying. Uh, and it changed my outlook on it because for me, it was always something I had to take very seriously because I didn't want to waste anybody's time. I, didn't, I never wanted anyone to think that I wasn't really trying to put my effort, my best effort into it. And that pairs with the fact that I was never a physically gifted athlete. I, you know, I would stay at home and a good night of practice for me was like, I'm going to throw 50 side kicks without putting my foot down. And I failed for hours before I could do it. I failed for days and days and days until I learned how to balance. And I had to go, you know, long form how to learn to do that because I naturally wasn't very good at it. I get that. I get that. Now, you you mentioned and hinted a bit before that, that there was some kind of transitional point. I think I heard in college where you started training very differently. Yeah. In, uh, it was actually where I, where I was training in high school. Um, there was uh, a gentleman and friend who he would also be, he was, you know, I think about, I think he's seven or eight years older than me, some, somewhere in that vicinity. So yeah, I was a teenager. He was in his early twenties. Um, but he was someone who'd been, you know, training. This was uh, Kempo Karate, a very uh, popular thing you find a lot of in Rhode Island and New England, typically kind of like an, uh, an offshoot or with heavy influence of kind of just a, a, a Shorinu Karate. But he was someone who always used to show up early and he had been training long enough that he was doing other arts. Hmm. And he was like, oh, come over here and let me throw you. Like, come over here and throw punches. I want to try these different techniques. So I just got used as the biggest punching bag in the room and had no idea what we were doing because I had never seen this stuff before. But broadened my horizons, broadened my scope, and had he had one day said that we always took a break in the summer because the armory didn't have air conditioning. So <laughs> instead of making everybody swelter through some of the hottest months or if people a lot of the people that were there were national guard so if they were going to have to do any of their duties or tours you know it just kind of broke and it just so happened that there was going to be a japanese sword group starting up in an area where this friend at the time I was training with was saying like, Hey, I know you're, I know you're, you know, doing stuff already, but there's going to be a little bit of a break coming up for you. Uh, if you can either get, if you can either drive yourself there, that's great. But you know, if you can get dropped off, I can drop you back off after class. And this is when I started training with Eric Johnstone, who you had on the show a couple of weeks ago. Yeah. Yeah. He was on not long ago. And I'm 17 years old and I get to, start doing start studying japanese sword and i thought i'm like this is it i'm finally a ninja turtle I, you I, you are leonardo this is, yeah. this is my final form and i mean i still re i remember the first classes that you know we were going through and we were at that time it was training at a shorunyu karate and, uh, and koburo school not very far away so i got to meet that teacher who is different than uh, Johnstone Sensei, the sword instructor, uh, teaching and having space at that, uh, the Karate Dojo. And I started doing the Shorinyu there and stopped doing the Kempo that I had been doing throughout high school. Hmm. Um, it just had, it was, you know, the New England Kempo was the, uh, the only martial art that I had ever really had experience with. And I, when I got to see the different types of martial arts that were out there and where different things were pulled from and how different things were taught, it just clicked that I want to, I, I love and I appreciate what I've done, but it's time for me to start doing other things. Makes sense. Yeah, the moment you mentioned Rhode Island, I, I was playing the odds in my head. What's the chance that Kempo is going to enter into oh, this yeah. conversation? And I figured it was about 75%. Yeah. Which maybe that's even a low number. Yeah. For, I mean, for those 
for those of you who are not New England martial arts, uh, I guess native is the right word. There are hotbeds, and, and I'm sure we're, everybody sees this. There are mm-hmm. hotbeds of various martial arts in various places. And Rhode Island is a hotbed for Kempo. Yep. So, yeah. Yeah, I, I think I'm trying to think of others that we've had on. When I think of the other folks that I know we've had on from Rhode Island, uh, Kempo enters into the equation for just about all of them. Yeah, I mean, I don't, uh, I don't know many people from Rhode Island or from, from New England that I'm aware of who did m- any sort of martial arts as a kid and did not set foot in uh, a Kempo school at some point. Yeah. Whether it was a, a long tenure or something that was short-lived and they found you know some of the Taekwondo in the area or something else, almost everyone's like, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. I remember that dojo on that corner next to that old candy <laughs> store that's now a gas station and yeah it's uh yeah. it's a nice feeling to, it's like oh yeah it's very rhode island it's you, you you all have some certain things i mean everybody's got those things right i'm in vermont we have certain things and sure. you know depending on area of the state you know that's a it's a lot of taekwondo yeah a lot of ta- actually north and south it's a lot of taekwondo hmm. so yeah i'm with you I'm with you. All right. So you're, you're morphing into your final form. Yep. So learning sword, college and learning. <laughs> there's, there's a lot going on. And how did, did this transitional point, how did that, that play out as you know, you were, you were kind of graduating off into your, your academics and, and the beginning of adult life. It was uh, it was very odd uh, as someone who finishing up high school, wanting to go up, wanting to do something, but not sure what uh, the only thing I really cared about. The only thing I really knew for sure was I want to keep training. And that was it was like wherever, wherever I go, no matter what happens, wherever I end up, I just want to keep training. Mm -hmm. But it was trying to pick where to go, what to do, what to study. My parents were very strict about needing to go to a four-year college. So I was lucky enough that uh, my best friend, who I've known since kindergarten, and I both got into Rhode Island College. We got to live together on campus. It was awesome. Uh, But the more awesome part was I got to train a lot. Uh, I started training in sword three or four days a week. I started training at the Shodenyu Karate School. Uh, and I, because my schedule was kind of flexible, because I picked all of my classes around when I wanted to train, <laughs> exactly how you should go to college. Uh, totally. Yeah. Absolutely. Uh, dear, just learn from my mistakes. <laughs> Focus on your schoolwork. <laughs> um, it'll just make it so much easier during finals. Uh, it, it worked out that I became quite close with uh, the Shodanyu teacher, and I was always available during the kids' classes that he had multiple nights a week. So I would show up and just be uke, and I would just be the punching dummy for all the kids' classes because I was like, oh, I'm trying to learn exactly what it is you do, and I'm trying to learn the differences, and I'm you know years behind where I think I want to be. So I pretty much would get to go to that school and train hours every few nights a week. And I thought it was amazing because I got to learn so much so fast from an an excellent teacher. His name is Joe Aiello. Uh, He lives in Connecticut now. Uh, But I got to form such good relationships with the young students, the children that were training there. And it was interesting to be in the in that role as you know a 18 19 year old kid in a room but also being a fully functional adult and knowing how to comport myself for the most part Mm. and i really have to thank again the teachers that i had you know growing up uh, predominantly uh, uh michael beaver uh was the kempo teacher that i was training with in uh, high school, his uh, his school, United Kempo Karate, uh, just, I mean, excellent role models, mentors, 
strong and stable influences on a young adult's life. Uh, that set me up for not just training and, and martial arts and just being in the dojo, but I mean, just learning how to comport yourself on a day to day basis in whatever situation you're going to be in is one of the things that I truly love and think is worth training. And I think martial arts and Budo and, and traditional martial arts in particular, I think really can help someone with. I agree. Preaching to the choir here. Yeah. That's for sure. <laughs> uh, All right. Yeah. Now, what about on the other side of other side of of your four year martial arts intensive? <laughs> uh, what what happened next? Uh, it it was a uh, a good. It was a really good effort to train throughout early twenties, uh, just as much as I possibly could. Um, it was in a pretty serious relationship for most of college and took about pretty much my senior year off of training. Uh, partially be due to the relationship, partially due to the insanity that is trying to double major at a college. Um, mm. But for me, the important part was I, I stopped going to the dojo, unfortunately, but what I never stopped was training. Uh, so I was always out in the backyard. I was always trying to you know, work on the things that I had been shown and I had been taught because I didn't want to lose any of it. And my goal was always to go back to the dojo someday. Uh, but when college ended, the relationship ended, uh, and I kind of wanted to get back to what I had known and what had always made me happy. And I uh, drove down to Connecticut on a Saturday morning pretty early. And uh, a few things had changed from the last time I had been at the dojo. and. I'm filling out another registration form and who walks in, but Johnstone sent it. He went, Oh, you still train? <laughs> and I, went, I hope to sense it. He's like, Oh, we're on the other side now. Go over there and change. Nice. And I, I was like, oh, okay, yeah, this, this still feels like home. Uh, that that's what I was going to poke at was that feeling that, you know, there, there's something to be said for stepping back into training. And I've had a couple experiences with this where, you know, five years, 10 years, honestly, uh, the longest period of time was, uh, was that 25 years, just about 25 years in between, between training with certain people and you step back in and there's something that never changes. Mm -hmm. You spend enough time with those people and maybe your skills change. Hopefully they, they improve and, and vice versa, their skills change and improve but there's a quality in the way that you work with someone that I, I don't know that I can put it into words. Maybe, maybe you can. I, I completely agree. Um, I think that, and there are times where um, whether or not you, you haven't seen the person in a while and you see them in a dojo again, um, you're, you know, y'all kind of, when you, when you're, when you're doing this and you're committed to it and there's, Sometimes that that commitment and that that agreement to doing it, even if there's years between life happens, all these things, um, sometimes that just doesn't what doesn't factor into that, in my opinion, necessarily is skill. You don't have to be the most skilled person at something to have a positive impact when you're training with other people. Sometimes it's just who you are and what you bring to the floor because you know we sometimes we talk about when we're training you know you leave things on the mat or you leave things at the door but you you are the whole you that you are you you know there's there's so much that any one person can bring and everyone is so uniquely individually brilliantly special in their life that you you never know who's going to touch your life how in any circumstance but i think at the dojo we all kind of open ourselves up to you know really having a hopefully having a very positive effect on everybody else's life yeah it's important to i, I think drive for that it's not always going to happen for everyone at least not in in volume but it's a good goal yeah it's it's something i try i try and think about too and then there's I, it, it's, 
it's it's kind of the family you choose a lot of the time mm, and for sure there's always a good feeling of like something comes up and you're not i shouldn't say a good feeling it's always nice as a reminder when something comes up and you can't make the event or you can't do this and you see a person again and they look at you and they're looking at you like you know you skipped easter dinner or when grandma was mm. or something and yeah. where were you and they're, you know, they, they come and I, I do the same thing. I go, I go to certain places and I don't travel a lot, but there are certain places I go or certain events I go to where I know that there are going to be people there from all over. And I look forward to seeing them just as much, if not more sometimes than I do when there is big family gatherings, because yeah. they're, they're the people I consider my family too. I get it. I'm, I'm right there with you. And I think that it's it's a wonderful feeling to know that you are you are wanted in that way hey you you missed such and such event yeah. you know Completely. somebody doesn't care they don't say anything yeah right they said something so they care and you know we don't talk too often on, on this show about the family dynamic that often arises out of a martial arts school it doesn't happen at every school i've been to plenty of schools where that doesn't happen but for the majority there's something that is intimate, not, I don't mean in a sexual way, but there's sure. something that is intimate about trading sweat and blood and volunteering the use of your body to someone else for their martial arts development, whether it's, you know, very light or even no touch up to, you know, really pounding each other in the skull. Yeah, I agree. It's uh, it, you, you really are certain types of training, certain times of training in certain schools or with certain people. Or even just, you know, in in someone's life where they are at this time, uh, it, it training can be a very intimate thing. And like you said, it, it's really just, you know, I don't I don't open up personally uh, to some random stranger about how I'm feeling on any certain day. That's not what I'm talking about. But if I'm willing to agree to be, you know, ferociously attacking someone. I've, I've got to really commit to that type of training and they have to agree to that also. And that's, that's kind of a conversation in a relationship. You don't just have with people, even you consider your best friends, you're, you're not just racking them with physical pain all the time. <laughs> and then like They're, giving each other a hug with a big smile as you can't shake hands because your wrists are too bruised. <laughs> yeah. The, the trust that is required is so it's intense even at an early level early stages of training you have to submit to this environment that is built on trust mm -hmm. and the schools that i see that don't work it's because that trust is not fostered at a high level yeah i, I when the trust is there everything else usually falls into place i would agree that type of and it, it, I think it lends itself very, very much to in you know in Japanese sword. Um, I've always been told. Uh, all my teachers have always said, uh, "You assume that the person that you would be fighting is at least as good as you are, if not better." You're these aren't civilian fighting traditions. This is you know Budo martial art in the purest sense of this was you know a warrior caste method uh it's always kind of fun to have to sit there and, and realize that you know not I, not only do i have to trust myself to not hurt anybody try and take care of everybody i know the things i need to know well enough that i can just do them and try to not dwell on them or brain them too much but you're you're putting a whole lot of faith in anybody else's ability to do the exact same thing. And not only does it might not jive as far as just a, a, a dojo dynamic or a group dynamic, but there are certain types of training. There's, you know, certain, certain things you're doing, especially when you bring weapons in, you know, there, there sometimes isn't a second chance. Mm, there's, there's it's a very, very good point. There's a whole lot of, you know, I've, I've been at events when, someone you know not certainly not intentionally i certainly hope not intentionally but a mistake was made and 
you know, we're training with bulkhead and we're training in a group and it might be tight quarters. And all of a sudden you hear the meaty whack of someone getting whacked with a piece of Oak. And it's, it's terrifying. And like everybody freezes for a second. And of course the person feels terrible, but we try and train with a mentality that that's not a wooden sword. That's a sword made of wood. Mm. And there, there are different people in different histories that, proved that and it is still a lethal weapon and even just a blinks span of time is all it takes to have that lack of mindfulness that we're all trying to train for and you know there's no apologies right that's a that's a that fosters the growth of a very different type of relationship than even the people i would consider my most dear friends the Mm -hmm. two o'clock on the side of the road i'm broken down who do i call list of people I don't even yeah. those people. I don't. I don't want swinging swords in my head. I don't. I, I, don't, I, don't <laughs> I get that. it. Now you brought up something that I'm, I'm thinking might be interesting: the impact of making a mistake when you have a sword, even if it's a sword made of wood, yeah. is different than the impact of missing a kick. Oh yeah, you know, missing the pull of a punch. You've trained in sword and non-sword arts. Does that discrepancy between the two lead to any, let's say, cultural or uh, um, environmental differences in the schools and the relationships that are fostered between the students? I would think I would think yes. Um, I'm fortunate as well that uh, training currently with Johnstone Sensei, uh, not only do we study. Uh, Japanese swordsmanship, but we also practice IT jiu-jitsu. I've studied some karate with him, uh, but also have done, you know, boxing outside and kickboxing. And it's it's very different because I've been punched in the face a lot. Uh, and that is not a brag. It, it's just it's and I would I would rather get punched in the face again over getting hit with a bulkhead or you know a metal sword uh edged or not it, it it it's a very different relationship to threat uh we constantly train even empty-handed um with the idea of even even if even if it's not drawn being in an empty hand encounter is still an edged weapon environment and when you're trying to really land a good hook on someone to do damage you have to deliver that type of force very differently than if you had a knife in your hand. Uh, mm. It can be very fast, very snappy, and uh, you got to get you have to you have to train differently. You have to react differently. Uh, I think that I'm I'm fortunate in the way that when you kind of recalibrate some of your mindset to the tip speed of a sword, fists just can't move that fast. Right. Uh, but it's it's again it's fostering the appreciation of the the combative distance the environment, um, and it's funny too because there are people who uh, have started training sword or train sword maybe a little more casually, um, who come in and it's not that they don't respect it, the tool or the weapon or the ideas, but it's a very different environment for them. And sometimes there's a um, kind of a, a, a delay in, in the, the translation of just how serious we're going to take this. Uh, but I've also, I, I think I learned, I was starting to, I started learning sword at the same time I really started digging into like Okinawa and Koburo. And one of the best things that I think Joe Aiello, Aiello sensei had ever done uh, he absolutely loved bull and loved yari, loved spear. Uh, and mm. we used to bull fight with six foot long rattan. Yeah. And goalie helmet on, lacrosse. Club. Oh, you were really going oh, at it. Yeah. And he had a set he called Kumi Bull Waza, uh, you know, fight, fighting sticks. And we ran these drills of, you know, freezing hands and disarms. And uh, it was it was sparring with a weapon. 
And I had done, you know, knife sparring before where you either chalk the blade or you put lipstick on the blade. And that changed the, you know, it completely changed the idea yeah. of proximity. Yep. But man, getting cracked full across the, not even, the, <laughs> I, I can honestly, I could remember how it feels and it wasn't across the head. It was across the shin with a six foot long rattan when I'm like, I'm too far away. He can't hit me from there. And man, oh man, did that not work out for me. <laughs> um, but it changed again. It changed my relationship and appreciation in just how close or how far or you know, like, like we were saying, who I, who I trust to train with. Uh, I'm I'm very defensive and very and and uh, you know on the defense with people who I, I I might be wary about while training and sometimes that's worse because now I'm overthinking things and I'm more prone to mistakes. But I'm trying to make sure that I you know have all my hands tomorrow for typing or it's it's a it's a very different appreciation uh, for the same reason I imagine you know anybody who goes to a boxing gym regularly. You have someone new coming in trying to knock everybody's head off. You can go, no, I'm, I'm, I'm fine. I'm not going to spar today. Mm. That's a great point. There's something in, in the way that you're talking about your sword work that has inspired me to ask this question. A little bit of background first. Mm -hmm. I have this theory that the first martial art that you put any real time into becomes kind of the language to which you refer everything else. You know, As an example, my initial training, my first... 14 years, 16 years of training was in karate. Mm. And I've branched out. I've done a bunch of different things. But when I do Taekwondo, anybody who really knows what's going on looks at it and says, that's a karate guy doing Taekwondo. <laughs> when I think about Taekwondo movements, I relate them back to karate. When I've trained in Kempo and Escriba and everything else that I've done, it comes back to this language that I have in within my body of karate. And when I talk to other people, when we have people on the show, it it seems to support this theory that the first thing you train in becomes the thing in which all your martial arts refers back to. But it almost sounds like that is not the case for you, that even though your first experience in martial arts was Kempo, it sounds like just in, in the way you're using words and you're describing principles, that your sword work has become your reference point from which you refer to the other things. Am I, am I off track here? No, it, 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 it very much feels like that when I, when I process things, when I went to doing, uh, I, I spent time hanging out with uh, MMA guys and Brazilian Jiu Jitsu schools and, and people. And I trained uh, with a fantastic coach in Moose Up, Connecticut, fantastic city name. Uh, his name's Greg Swanson. We were doing Sambo. Uh, yeah. it, everything always comes back to cut to center, posture, keep keeping my you know, keeping my hips uh, pressuring, semi, and it it is the vernacular that makes sense to me. And I think that I think it holds true. Maybe not that it was my the first martial art I ever trained, but looking at it now, I'm 33, and I started training when I was 17. Uh, with Johnson Sensei and Sword, with some breaks in between, uh, it is the lens in which I view all martial arts. Okay, and yeah, and and that's what I was hearing, and I think that you're you're an exception. I mean, certainly theories are meant to be tested, mm -hmm. but I think you're the first person that I can concretely say, yeah, what I've heard contradicts my theory so that's fascinating <laughs> to me and how much of that do you think is because your passion for the sword work you know it was it was it was delayed you know there was definitely some delayed gratification but again we go we go back to this very early idea of what martial arts was for you and it was rooted in this desire to you probably would have used the verb play back then but to utilize to train with these weapons specifically sword yep yeah it was and it everything was else was a holding pattern until you got there yeah it was a dream and it was you know i i knew that in eventually in kempo you they teach you some sword stuff and i was like oh okay i'll get there someday 
and then I found out you you could just go you could just go study sword. <laughs> are you are you kidding me? Like I don't have to do this other stuff. Yeah, like and and I, I still want to go do all that other stuff too. But are you kidding me right now? <laughs> it it was, and I think for me, and it's it's the reason why I I still love it so much is, uh, it is something that is, uh, and th- there there are so many different sword styles you can train and so many fantastic people you can train with i am so unbelievably fortunate that all of the crazy random happenstances could have aligned to be fortunate enough to find a fantastic teacher and line of teachers and a fantastic group with an art and a style that is so well preserved I, it's just, I, I don't know of many people that have found it, had found the thing that they want to keep doing when they were 17 years old. Hmm. That's a great point. I, Are you as passionate about it still as you were then? Um, yes, I would say. Um, I think that I appreciate it differently now. Okay. Um, what does that mean? When I was younger, God, that makes me sound so old. Um, <laughs> when I was when I was younger, I loved to train because I loved to train. Uh, it, I just I I wanted to be doing something. I always wanted to move. It was my favorite thing to do. It was my favorite form of exercise. I would train. I would I would get up and train at a, a 6 a.m. class and I would train in the afternoon. And then when I got home, I would want to train again. And I absolutely loved it. But I think with age, uh and I'm also and you know, we were we were talking a little bit before about uh just kind of the 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 vibe of a dojo and the the trust of people there and uh, I'm I'm extremely fortunate that I've had some really excellent teachers, but also mentors uh, who taught me a lot more than just how to throw a punch or swing a sword or smack someone's shin with a bow or anything. I've you know I very much learned the person I wanted to be from the people I was training with. And now being 33 years old, having, you know, a big boy job and owning a home and being married and all all these other things, uh, I honestly don't think I would be the same person if I had just stopped training. I think it I think it has fundamentally changed and influenced the person I am today. And I think it's one of the reasons I just appreciate it so much now. Because everybody else is a perfectly functional human being without it, and I'm very jealous. <laughs> it's it's interesting as there are a lot of things like this that as we make them core to who we are, as we build our foundation around something and in this case martial arts you know this is something i feel you feel i'm sure a huge portion maybe even the majority of the listeners feel we're great with it we're better with it yeah but without it we are below the average person without it because we are so aware of what it is that we have depended on we've put stock of who we are into it and the absence is rough. And, and for a lot of us, you know, over the last year with COVID, that's really surfaced. We've seen that. Oh, this is not a version of me that I enjoy, for example. I've heard that from people. Yeah, definitely. That's it. It definitely is. Uh, it, it changes you. It, it, it kind of or, or changes me. It, I think it, it does a lot to, uh, in a lot of ways, just curb my own ego when it starts to rise because no one's perfect. We're, we are all very flawed individuals at the same time as being amazing. But it, for me, uh, uh, Carl Long sensei is the, 
the current Soshihan of this sword group. And we have uh, the, the calls we've had this past year and, you know, talking about stuff. One of the main things that he says that it sticks with me um, is he talks about uh, the real dojo is in the heart mm. and how, you know, it's important. And he's really looking forward to seeing everybody again. And he really wants people to, you know, remember the feeling, even if you can't be there right now, of just how straight your back is when you're in the dojo changing to step on the mat for class. And remember just how good you feel about how the problems that you had on the drive over and how you're going to make things work right now, they're not, they're not you know, weights that you're towing behind you. And remember that feeling because that's the important feeling. That's the, that's the thing that you can bring into the world to help other people. And, you know, that your, that your Budo, that your training will really uh, show people what it's doing for you. The, the, the real dojo is in the heart. And it's something, you know, John Sensei has said time and time again to all of us. And, you know, we're, we're fortunate enough because this year's been really rough. It, it's, it's really put a dividing line between what we can do, what we want to do, what's important to us. And I, I love so many things. I, I think music is amazing. I love movies. I'm a huge D and D nerd. Uh, I, there's, there's so many things I love, but when it comes back to the things that enrich my life and make me a better person for all of the other people in my life, I, I, I need to always make sure I make time for my training for, for, for Budo to, to make sure that I keep myself on the right path. I get that. I totally get that. And do you have any advice, I guess? Let's, let's say we have newer martial artists listening who, who are nodding along and they might be saying, you know, guys, I, I, I get it. I understand it conceptually. But how does that, how do, how do I do that? What can I do? You know, maybe I'm a month in or a year in or, 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 you know, really any length of time, but what advice would you give to someone who's asking, how do I, how do I support that need in myself? Read more Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtle comics. Um. <laughs> <laughs> that, that would work. That is a way, right? It, it's, it, there's a, there's a joke there, but I, I don't think it's yeah. wrong. Yeah. Uh, it, for, for me, it's, it's funny because, again, I've, I've been I feel like for so long I've been probably the youngest guy in the room at a lot of things. So I constantly feel out of place. Uh, I, I growing up, that was how I felt um, in, even in my late 20s. That's kind of how I felt. Uh, but the. One of the ideas that, uh, that kind of always comes back to me is. Uh, you when you're deciding to do this when you're deciding to train uh the important part is to keep training and the training isn't just show up to class on time remember all the moves it is trying to keep keep a sense and an understanding of what it is you're trying to do and hopefully that's you know be a better person to enrich your own life hopefully enrich other people's lives. Uh, I have been unbelievably fortunate training in my time and, and growing up uh, that I was always the person who would volunteer to go get punched somewhere at an event. Uh, and I cannot tell you how that has benefited me. Uh, because at one, I got more training time. I, I got very mm -hmm. used to being out in front of people and I got used mm -hmm. to having to go and talk to complete strangers. And when you're, you know, a, a 21, 22 year old person or younger trying to do that. And, you know, I, I think I had gone on two job interviews before a lot of this time, uh, yeah, if I'm going to go throw punches at grown men at some event to try and do a technique that neither one of us are good at, yeah, I can sit down and talk about my job experience for the next 45 minutes. I'm not afraid of that. 
Uh, exactly. It's the reason I still keep, I put martial arts on my resume too. Uh, it, it's a fantastic conversation starter, but there's so many lessons to learn. Uh, you've got to be willing to sacrifice, I think, especially, you know, there's levels to that that you are and aren't going to be comfortable with when you start training. But if you make it a priority in your life, uh, to the best of your ability, if you're able to sacrifice things here and there to make events and make time and help out, uh, I, I think it pays dividends later on because you're someone who can be seen as reliable. You understand how to comport yourself, hopefully better than you might otherwise. Uh, it's it's a hard question because you know there. I think it I think it may come into play. You know when you find what you want to do. If you're someone who is like I was a teenager, you kind of can throw responsibility to the wind sometime and really make your own schedule around things. When you're someone who's a little bit older and you've got a little bit more responsibilities, uh, you just make the best of every situation, make the best of every training, uh, be genuine and train with a, a, an open heart. And I think people see that. I think people can feel it and they're going to want to keep training with you. They're going to want you to come back. They're going to want you around. I, I want to connect a couple dots mm -hmm. in there. We we talked earlier about the relationship that comes from the intimacy of training with people. And then you talked about kind of, um, I don't know that you used quite these words, but making other people the priority, this kind of notion of, of service and deferment. Uh, you were going to these events, getting punched, building those relationships. Not only do I think those connect, I think it's the only way. Because in order for martial arts to work as we understand it, someone has to make someone else's training a priority. Your instructor is making your training a priority. And in doing so, they're benefiting. Maybe they're benefiting financially. Maybe they're benefiting by becoming a better martial artist themselves as they explain things, ideally both. But if you practice selfish martial arts, Nobody wins. Yeah. If you practice selfless martial arts, everyone wins. Yeah. I agree. And I just wanted to connect those dots for the listeners. I think that those are important concepts that, that we've just uh, worked through. Yeah. I think it's a, we, we talk about it sometimes in the, uh, if you've ever taken music lessons and you don't practice between the lessons, you mm. get good very slowly. <laughs> <laughs> uh it, yes. it just it doesn't work that way uh if you're if you're committed to training if you're you know you're you're paying to go to training you're paying for someone's time you're taking up other people's time uh if you haven't practiced uh you're you're gonna get good very slowly and you may not be in a race that's probably not the point but the other person may have trained really hard and kind of studied up for the class so that they're ready to really train hard and diligently. And all of a sudden they got to shift gears down to meet you where you are. That's going to happen yeah. every day, every time, every time you ever train. But if you commit to putting in the work outside of class and not just in class, you're going to be rewarded so much by enhancing your own training, enhancing other people's training, feeling like you are not behind the eight ball when you're trying to get things done. And that's another, you know, it, it comes down to, you know, personal sacrifice of, you know, am I not going to go out because I want to train tonight? Am I, am I going to wake up early tomorrow so I can run through Kappa again? Or am I going to, you know, really look back on the notes I took 10 years ago because that those two different paired sets are a little hazy right now. Hmm. All of those, you know, it's, it's being a very, it, it's, it's not taking it as like a, a passive bystander. I got you. I'm with you. Nodding along, nodding <laughs> along on everything that you've been saying oh, today. I also want to unfortunately clarify when I make the joke that go somewhere and get punched in the face, it sounds so abusive. <laughs> it's not, it's just the morbid humor of being, able yeah, to go I, and I, I don't, I don't know that me. you I don't know that you need to explain that here. I think everyone gets that. I hope so. I just didn't want it to come off as too too morbid or too too kind of unfortunate. Uh, I love every event that I've ever been in, a, been a part of, and even the times when you get you know an unexpected shot here or there because um, an accident happens or distance is wrong. I mean, 
even then you take them in stride. Right. Because again, you have to, Yeah. because we have to have that trust, that relationship with each other else. The training doesn't work. You can only train as hard as the trust supports. Exactly. Uh, doing uh, events and having gone places with Johnston Sensei as my primary teacher. Uh, it's funny because uh, Johnston Sensei's, you know, maybe I think he's 5'11. He's probably, you know, 180, 185 of just like built muscle. And I'm 6'1, just over 300 pounds. Uh, when he tells me to throw haymakers, boy, howdy, I'm throwing haymakers and I'm not throwing a miss. I'm, I'm throwing a hit. And that took a long time to develop that training and that trust. We didn't start out doing that. Never. You never start out at Mach 10 with everybody, <laughs> but Hope when not. you're trying to demonstrate the effectiveness of a technique or an idea, and it's off of a few punches, it, it works really well when you actually got someone throwing shots at you. And I can only do that because I know he's good enough that he can handle this. And you build those relationships up with different training partners or teachers over a long period of time. Hmm, that's for sure. <laughs> hey, if people want to get a hold of you, is, is there anything we can give them? Some social media, some email, something like that? Uh, my, I'm on Facebook under okay. Matt King. I think, I think I might be Matt King 2287. I am also on Instagram with the same handle. And my mm -hmm. email address would be mking2287. If anybody ever wanted to reach out or talk about martial arts, or if you're in Rhode Island or New England, or, you know, please feel free. I'm a, I'm a pretty chatty person. Is that your birthday? Uh, no, it's not. It's, it was just numbers. But, I was trying to do the math. I was trying to do the math. It didn't uh, well, quite it line is, up, but it was close. Uh, uh, my birthday is actually 11 87 yeah. So I just put 2287 because I needed four numbers. I think, I think Got that it. was like my AOL uh back in like your your like, aim screen name yeah it was some something like that i need i love i it. needed numbers because like my sister had numbers so i thought that was cool but my mom was right. like don't put your birthday down so i was like i won't i'll do something else and now and now anytime someone sees it it's like oh you're born in february I'm like no 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 not not quite true rock on well this is this has been great i appreciate you coming on and being so fun and open and you know, indulging all my silly questions. It's been great. Thanks for having me. I hope, I hope I didn't ramble too much. And you rambled perfectly. And I'm going to ask you to ramble just a little bit more. Yeah. This is where you close it up and then I'll, I'll record an outro later on. So what are your last words to the audience today? Oh man, live long and prosper, I guess. Um, I don't know if you can use that sound bite. Sorry. Um, <laughs> I, you know, I, as someone who I, it's funny to have had the conversation with my my absolutely lovely wife and friends and, you know, people who are dear to me. And it's this is something I plan on training in whatever capacity I can for as long as I can. I, I want to make it a, a, a lifelong contributor to what I can get from it. And more importantly, what I can give to it and give to other people. Uh, I just hope that everybody, uh, especially with the world the way it is right now, uh, COVID and, and so many things going on, I hope that people can find some solace in their training and uh, hope that it can kind of reignite a passion they have in themselves for bettering themselves and hopefully being a better person for everybody that they might find in their life. It really has the capacity to do that. I believe. I'm, I told you in the intro, we got into some really cool stuff. And if you're still listening, it's because, well, you know, you know that what I said is true. There's some really cool stuff. And how about that, that transitional point of starting to see the world, not from the Kempo that he grew up with through the lens of a sword. I found that, absolutely fascinating maybe you didn't but i did because i think it's the first time we've ever seen that from a guest so really cool sensei thanks for coming on the show had a blast we will talk again i'm, I'm i have no doubt listening you can get more 
You can go deeper. Go to whistlekickmartialartsradio.com. Go find the videos and the links and the photos and the social media and all that good stuff that we post over there for every single episode, like this one. And transcripts make it up there eventually. Delay on some of them, but they're getting there. Blog. If you want to read or, you know, search, if there's something that somebody said and you're saying, oh, didn't somebody talk about this in a prior episode? Hey, that's part of why we put the transcripts together. It helps you get what you want and need out of each and every episode. And if that means something to you, if you want to support that, you've got some choices. You could leave a review, you could buy a book on Amazon, or you could help out with our Patreon, patreon.com slash whistlekick. And do you know we have the only speed development program designed for martial artists? Make you faster, designed specifically to make you faster. Yep, we do. I made it myself. Did a bunch of research. It's super cool. It works. And you can get it at whistlekickprograms.com. Check it out. You will get faster. You have my word. The code podcast15, you're going to get 15% off that or any other program or any of the stuff at whistlekick.com. Yeah, you can still get the programs at whistlekick.com. You know, don't don't worry. Don't worry. Nothing's, it's not going anywhere. Suggestions? Those are going somewhere. Those are coming to us from you. Email me, jeremy at whistlekick.com. Our social media, we put a lot of effort into it. It's at whistlekick. Is it up today? Until next time, train hard, smile, and have a great day. Mm-hmm.